We are continuing our series on New to Hebrew Roots, and, and like I've shared before, this is going to be a long process. This is actually part three of this, this specific point of faith, and the plaintiff has said this. The plaintiff has said, if the law worked, speaking of the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, if the law worked, faith would be irrelevant. Therefore, we do not need the law, is what they say, because we have faith. Because what they're saying is in the Old Testament, all those Old Testament people didn't have faith. They had the law. So because they had the law, they didn't need faith. They could trust in the law and just observe the law and then everything would be okay. But now that we are underneath a new umbrella of thought process because Messiah has come, the first advent of Messiah Yeshua with Jesus coming and doing all that he did to fulfill and complete the task that he had to, we no longer need the law because we can accept his works as being the works that satisfy what God needed for us to have. And all we have to do is have faith in what he did, and so we no longer need the law. That's how they divide it. Now, when I ended last time in, in our part two of this, I made mention of a very important part that I'm going to hammer on a lot tonight. And that is you cannot have one without the other. You cannot have faith without the law. And you cannot have the law without faith. And I'm going to substantiate that by showing you what the New Testament believers saw when they looked back in time and they would look down the corridor and they would look at the witnesses that have gone before them and give testimony of what their life was. And we're going to see what they thought. And we're going to kind of think about, is that how we do it? Is that how we see it? Is that how we perceive it? And where are we at ourselves? So we're going to try to bring this all together tonight as we look at this. So when I read this, I want you to know that this is what the plaintiff says. This is an argument that, is, that has been brought forth that says we no longer need the Torah. We no longer need the instructions that were originally given to us by Yahweh himself. At Mount Sinai to his people, uh, that's done away with. That's the old and new has come. Messiah's here. All we need is faith. Kind of reminds me of a Beatles song. All you need is love. How many of you have tried that and it worked? <laughs> it was pretty good, wasn't it? I just left. Well, they, they base it on this passage of Scripture in Romans 4, verses 13 and 14. It says this. For the promise was not through law to Abraham or to his seed, for him to be the heir of the world, but through a righteousness of faith. And we had to go back and define some of these words there in previous lessons, so I won't back up and, and define them again or go in depth with them. But it's important to understand that this, what's saying here is the law is not defining whether or not he is in right relationship as far as being an heir. But it's not saying that he doesn't need to obey the law. The law does not say that you or I are in right relationship. The law simply states this is what has to take place. Now, this analogy that I'm giving you is the same thing that we apply when we apply faith in our lives. You see, there's a lot of people who come to church. There's a lot of people who come to fellowship. And they learn the rule book. And they learn how to do strategy. They talk Christianese. They talk about faith. How you play the game. What it's like to be involved. But most of them are never engaged in a game. They never really make the team. They show up. They're there. They practice, they sound good, they look good, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof because they only take part of what they want and apply that, and they don't take the entire Word of God and apply it. As we're looking here at Romans, we see that, that Abraham had a law book. He had instructions. But the instructions didn't give him the inheritance. He worked out, was part of the team. But until the coach made him an official member of the team, he wasn't a member. So when it's dividing here, saying that the law had nothing to do with his inheritance, that is absolutely true. It didn't. 
when the coach made him part of the team, then he was part of the team. But in order to be part of the team, he had to have the law to bring him into the right relationship for him to be an heir. That might have went foom over some of your heads. So we're going to work through this process and hopefully get you to the point where you understand that faith in characters that we define, it's impossible to please him without faith. And so it requires action on our part. Just because we know that God says he will save all those that say, I believe, just saying I believe because you're following the rule book until he acknowledges you because you have faith in him, it doesn't apply to you. Now that's a tough statement because what I basically just said is that just because you said you believe doesn't mean that you're in right relationship with him. If you are not walking in the footsteps of Yeshua, Messiah, you are not part of the family. That's a tough statement, and it's a bold one. But let's see if I can back it up with Scripture here. So let's continue on and just do a quick review on some of the things. Faith, the word faith, it's important for us to understand what faith is. Remember in today's vernacular, in most, most churches today, they look at faith as being abstract I have faith, I have trust, I believe. But what does that look like? When you ask someone what that looks like, how are you exhibiting your faith? They go, um, uh, um, well, you know, uh, I, I read the manual. Um, uh, I showed up at practice and, uh, well, you know, uh, hey, there you go. You see how that ties in? It's, it's abstract to them. They don't have anything concrete. So we wanted to take this back, so we took it back to the original paleo, to the Otiot Aramaic uh, Letters, and, and this is what we find out what faith is. Faith is Aman in, in the ancient Hebrew. And it starts out with Aleph, Mem, and Nun. And Aleph is the, the ox head, and it has to do with the father. It has to do with headship, being yoked with him. It has to do with his power and his strength. So faith starts out with God being the most prominent part of anything that happens with faith. Then we see Mem is the second one, and that has to do with water or the word or cleansing and washing, especially in the blood. And this, this is Yeshua, that we are washed in him and cleansed in his blood. And then Nun is this. It has to do with the seed, the good seed. It has to do with life. It has to do with perpetuation where it's something that starts and doesn't stop. It has to do with heir and offspring. So when you look at faith in the Paleo-Hebrew, when they translated this word and said, you need to have faith, this is what you need to have. You need to have a heart and a life that is cleansed in the blood of Yeshua. You have been washed and you have been made clean so that you can take on the power and strength and be yoked with Father above and you become heirs and it's a perpetual heirloom that you have because you are in him. That's what faith is. That's pretty strong when you look at it. All of a sudden, it doesn't have this little fluffy thing of just trust and believe. This means I have to trust in God. I have to be cleansed by his son. And as an heir, I have to now trust in everything that he says and everything that he tells me I should do, I do. And that's the premise of what it is. Now, here are some of the characteristics of faith that we looked at. First of all, we saw that faith, without faith, it is impossible to please Yahweh. You cannot please Yahweh. If you are not in Him, if you've not been cleansed by His Son, if you are not an heir, you are not pleasing Him. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible. You can do the letter of the law all you want. You can play church all you want. You can be as good as you can be in this life, and it's not good enough. Because God's plan is not about just doing good things. It's about being in Him. The second characteristic that we looked at is that faith without works is not faith. In fact, it's, it's useless. We see that in, in the book of James, Yaakov. Chapter 2, verse 26, For as the body is dead apart from the spirit, so also faith uh, without deeds is what? Dead. Now, I want to bring something up here because when we read this, we, we miss a little something here that is really profound. It says, For as the body is dead apart from the spirit, 
And we, when we look at that, we, we often think, well, our spirit and our body are two different things. And, and so we think that the spirit is dealing with us because we think of our spirit being who we are. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about back in Genesis when God the Father created Adam and he formed out of the dirt and the mud and the, all the, the elements that creates man and the water. I mean, everything that makes this body. It's called a nephesh in Hebrew. He created this body and then it says that he breathed into that nephesh, that, that clump of dirt. He breathed into them. Ruach. His spirit, his breath, and that nephesh became a living being, a living soul. So when the body is absent from the spirit breath of God, that body is dead. So this spirit that's being talked about here isn't your soul, your inner being. This is God taking his means of life, his ruach out. And so the nephesh goes back to the dirt in which it was. So it's important for us to understand that there because sometimes we try to use this verse and say, well, our, our, our spirit, inner soul, who we are, and that's why we've departed and our body's dead. No, you're dead because God took life away from you. He took ruach away from you. And therefore you are dead. And, and so we see that the, the second definition here, or characteristic, excuse me, of faith is that it indeed is not faith. It is dead if it is not being used. Faith without works is dead. Just like a body that no longer is breathing, there's no life in it. And then the third one is faith, active faith, brings justification. And we, we looked at justification uh, earlier uh, in, in my notes last time, I had Romans 2.16, but it was actually Galatians 2.16, so I apologize, but I did correct that, but I don't think I corrected it on your, on your paper, so you might want to make that correction on your paper. But Paul is very adamant when he's speaking about faith and justification. I just want to bring out some other passages of Scripture that he mentions. In Romans 3.20, he said, Because by works of the Torah, not one of all flesh will be justified before him. In other words, working the Torah, doing everything by the letter. I kept the Ten Commandments. I was good. I behaved. I did everything that was right, that seemed good. It doesn't bring justification if we have not trusted in Him. In Romans 3.28, it says this. Then we conclude a man to be justified by faith without works of the law. See, here, here that statement is again that, that in faith putting our trust in God the Father through the Son, making us an heir, we become justified, we become right in Him so that we can live for Him. Romans chapter 4 verse 5 says this, But to the one not working, but believing on Him, justifying sinners, His faith is counted for righteousness. Isn't that neat? We have our works showcasing substantiating the reality that God has created in us that heirship because of our trust and faith in Him. And it's cyclical. It's almost like which came first, the chicken or the egg. And, and Albert and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. Well, at what point is faith completely trusting in Him and that He gave you the faith and then it's faith that's the action that causes God to do something that makes us to have the faith to start to be able to do something all over again. And... I am so confused. But as we continue to look at the, the witnesses here, we'll, we'll get a little bit more in tune of what's being said. In, in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says this, Therefore, being justified by faith. That's how we're justified. By faith. Now, you've got to remember what faith is. You go back to the Hebrew. Go back to the original. Justification is by me being in faith. And being in faith means I'm in the Father, through the Son, I've become an heir. And Paul constantly goes over this. And there are several other verses that are really cool, but I'm not going to go over that. That's something else that you can pick up on your own study. It is a wonderful thing to know that because 
of what Yeshua has done for us and bringing us in right relationship to have faith in Him, it brings us to the point where we become justified. Justified means that we have been put in proper position so that we can now go before the Father who is a righteous and holy God where before we could not. Now, through His Son Yeshua, we have access to the throne to bring our petitions to Him, to have that intimate relationship where before we did not have that. See how it just builds on itself? Now, this is a plan that God has created that is perfect because it does bring us in that right relationship with Him. So those are the characteristics. So it brings us to the, the question, did the writers of the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, believe that all those before Yeshua's death, his burial and his resurrection, that they were saved by following the law, the Mosaic law? Now, most of the church today teaches that that's what took place. That at the advent of Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection, boom, something new we no longer need the law. We only need to have faith in Jesus and what he's done. And life is wonderful. I have no guidelines because the old is done away. The new is here. And when you read the New Testament, it just sounds like, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I feel good about myself and I say hi to my neighbor. So everything's hunky dory. I don't cheat the guys that I work with. I work and I do good. You know, I basically keep the Ten Commandments while I don't keep the fourth one because Sabbath, you know, it's, it, it doesn't apply anymore because that's old. But I do have a time that I do set aside and I, I do that. And oh, I, I don't take the name of the Lord in vain. I, you know, Third Commandment, I don't really need to, I really, I don't swear. <laughs> I really don't. I don't take his name in vain. <laughs> Golly gee. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't even use little things that might hint that way. No, 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 not me. No, no, I'm going to follow him all the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be. I honor my mom and dad. Uh, they've got their life. I've got mine. I don't have to worry. That there's an old folks home for them when they get old. I don't have to worry about them. You know, everything's taken care of. They've got their 401k, B, C, and D. I don't know what they've got, but they're well taken care of. I don't have to worry about it. My responsibility is over. I'm 18. I left the house. Everything's fine. Oh, boy. <laughs> I could go through every single one of the Ten Commandments, and you and I have broken every single one of them. Well, I, I have not. I've not committed adultery. If you have even thought it, Yeshua says. Because all sin starts in the heart. The heart. <laughs> the seed of the emotion, the mind, it starts there. And that's what Yeshua is teaching in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He sits his disciples down and he says, now look. You've heard it told, thou shalt not, but I tell you, if you even think about it, you've committed that sin already because it started here. Just because you didn't carry it out doesn't mean that you haven't committed the act because in your mind, you have. And see, don't fear him who can kill the body, but fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hellfire. He knows your thoughts. He knows who you are. You know, you look up here and you see this little preacher in front of you. You hear me babble week after week. You hear me tell the funny stories. You hear me and watch me get into my antics because I love what God has called me to do. And I preach the word as best I can, and I'm not easy on you, because I'm going to tell you the truth, and then you and, and the Father can work it out, because I'm working those exact same things out in my life. But do you think you know me? But we really don't know each other, but the Father does. He knows us inside. He knows everything about us. We are not hiding anything from Him. You may even be hiding it from yourself. You may be saying, I'm okay. I got news for you. None of us are okay. But what the body does today is, oh, you don't think the same way I do? Well, I don't want anything to do with you because I've got it all and you've got it wrong. And we think that we've got it right. Why do you think there's so many denominations? 
It's because somebody got their feelings hurt because somebody didn't see it the same way that I see it. And so they said, he's wrong, I'm right, I'm leaving. And I told someone last night, I said, look, <laughs> when we get before the throne, he's going to tell us you're both wrong. And, and then he could, he could bring out a whole list. But he's not going to do that. He's going to say, now we have eternity to get it right. And that's the blessed hope that we have that's really kind of cool. But in understanding, you may not always agree with everything that Tom teaches or I teach or other teachers that are out there. It's your responsibility to be Bereans, to get in the Word, search it, and come to an understanding yourself. And then, and then... Go back to your brother and talk about it again. And if you still disagree, it's okay. You don't see where Mark and Barnabas and Paul have their feud and then go and never speak to each other again. You see later on that Paul says, bring Mark, I have need of him. And you see Barnabas and Paul coming back together. Does that mean that they, they put everything aside? No, I'm sure they still had some discussions. I'm sure they talked about, and, and listen, we're talking about Paul here. You know, Shaul, the guy who wrote 14 of the New Testament letters and books that we have. The one that Peter says, I don't even understand him. I'm a disciple of Messiah taught at his feet, but Paul scares me because I don't always understand what he's saying. Because Paul was brilliant. And God used him in a mighty way. But yet people would twist and turn what he had to say. And, and bring doctrines and beliefs that made them feel good. Instead of looking at it at face value and putting it in context and say, Alright, here's something that's concrete. God's word does not change. If you tell me that the Tanakh, the Old Testament, is done away with, I'm happy to tell you that I no longer have a God. Because my word tells me, His word, the Scripture, tells me He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will not change. And if I believe that, then from the very first word in the book of the Bible, the the Holy Bible? No, I just can't. <laughs> Better sheet. Genesis in the beginning and come all the way to the end. Amen and amen in Revelation. Everything in between has to be true and constant because the scriptures are the living word of Yah. So you have to take the Old Testament. The Old Testament just means that it's older than the newer one. Because right now, the New Testament is old to us. It's 2,000 years old, folks. It wasn't written last week. It's an old document. Some of it was found in caves. The New Testament is an old document. So the whole book is old. The whole book is older than time itself because the book is the living word. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word, whoa! That's good preaching. I'm glad you told me that. I only know what I know, which isn't much. So I'm going to trust that what I've studied so far is true. And if someone can show me in Scripture where that has changed, then I will change. And that's what faith is. Faith is when you find out the concreteness of it, you stay there. You don't move. In other words, your faith brings you in right relationship through Yeshua, noon, to the Father and His power, Aleph, to make us heirs. Isn't that great? I made a mistake, though. It, it, 
that through the sun is mem, and noon is the, the seed, those of us that are seed. So in, in Messiah, through the Father, we are the seed, and that remains constant as long as we're in the Father through the Son. If we are no longer in the Father of the Son, if our faith has diminished, we are no longer under His grace, under His tent, do we have that? It's a different story for another time. I'm going to very quickly go over Hebrews chapter 11, the 40 verses. I know some of you are going, oh boy, it's a long night. No, we'll, we'll go through it fast. Verse 1 says this, faith. The word faith is a noun. A noun is a person, place, thing, and or idea in today's vernacular. So it's something that has sustenance. It's concrete it's solid we looked up this word earlier in one of our previous lessons and it meant foundation actually so to have faith is is foundational it's something that has sustenance and it's concrete and as a result of that we have hope the king james version says now faith is the substance of things hoped for so it is something that's tangible concrete that we have hope in now when I was younger, I used, to, <laughs> I used to do some really weird stuff. But I, I didn't, and, and sometimes I still don't, have the confidence in myself that I should have. But when it comes to girls, you girls scare me. You just do. And, and it's just something innate in me. I don't know what it is. But when I was in, in kindergarten, there was this one girl I liked. So I wrote a note that said, do you like me? And then I put a little box, and I put yes. And I put another little box and said no. And check one, right? And I gave it to her. I just didn't put my name to it because I was afraid she was going to say no. You see, I hope she would like me, Patty, but she might not. So I was afraid to ask her. Because the hope I had wasn't really hope. It was, it was confusion. It was doubt. It was fear that she wouldn't accept me because, you know what? I know a little bit of who I am, and I'm not really that nice. I try to be nice. I want you to think I'm nice. But am I really nice? I'm a sinner. Yeah, my granddaughter's going, no. <laughs> That's because I don't give you any slack, kiddo. But I feared, I, and, and trying to, to have this hope that she would like me, but I vacillated back and forth. That is not the hope that's talking about here. This is the kind of hope that this hope is about. It is sure, it is concrete, it is going to happen no matter what. For example, tonight when I go home, there are some coconut macaroons on the counter. There is a bag of tea waiting for me. That rhymed. Pretty good, huh? Now that is a sure thing. I'm hoping when I get home to have what? Some tea and some macaroons and to put my feet up and to just relax and say, Father, another one down. What do you want me to do now? And then I'm going to start questioning. Did I say everything I was supposed to? Did I do it right? Where did I mess up? <laughs> and start critiquing myself. But I can tell you this. I have a hope that is sure that when I get home, there's tea and there's a macaroon. That's what this is talking about. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And then he goes on to use another word in there of evidence of things unseen. Evidence. Evidence means that there's something tangible that you can see. There's something in our faith that can be tangibly grasped and made real. Faith has to be Something that you and I can experience in a real, tangible way right now. And our hope is that in grasping the faith of being in Messiah through the strength and yoked with the Father, we have heirship, that in the process of that, when I die, I go to spend eternity with Him. Let me ask you a question. Am I there yet? No, because you're looking at me. If I was six foot under and this life was over, my decision was made, and now at the judgment, he will say yes or no. I am pursuing and hoping and trusting by faith in him and being an heir with him and doing and obeying what I'm supposed to 
because of the evidence that is before me following the law the end result is eternal life with him see how that connects very important for us to see that the evidence is now about to unfold in front of us as we look at the next verse talks about the witnesses and who are these witnesses let's look at them real fast and I'm going to point out something about each one of them. First of all, when you look at all these witnesses, the first thing they did was they recognized that Yahweh, yod he wah was the creator of the universe. You see that in verse 3. Foundational, very beginning. If you don't believe in God, then everything else and everyone else that is a witness here means absolutely nothing. You always start with the Father. Always. Always. It's about him, folks. It's not about me. It's not about the patriarchs we're about to look at. It's about him. So the first thing we see in verse 3, the writer of Hebrews is bringing to mind that faith equals the Father or has sustenance in him. Verse 4, we see about Abel. What did Abel do? Abel brought a lamb and sacrificed it on the altar. Listen to what I just said. Abel brought a lamb and sacrificed it on the altar. Abel did something. Abel knew the law. He already knew the instructions and he acted it out and he did what the father said and what was the result of it? His faith being acted out. Remember that's one of the actions that you have to do. Faith in action brings justification. He became justified in the father's sight because he acted in obedience and because of his actions, what did God do? Showed favor. In so much so that even though he was prematurely murdered, we're still talking about him today. God honored him by keeping his name, the essence of who he is, to teach us that our actions, by being faithful in obedience to the instructions and having faith in God, it brings the right relationships and brings us into justification with him. Then we see in verse 5 that Enoch did the same thing. Now Enoch is one of these guys, I, I, I have no where to go with this. Because I don't know where Enoch is. I mean, there he is, whoop, there he isn't, he's gone. What did he do? He followed the instructions of the Lord. He was constantly wanting to be in the presence of the Lord. He gave everything that he had to the Lord. As a result of it, the Lord said, why don't you just be with me? And I don't know what that means. Except scripture says, there he was, there he isn't. He's with the Lord. And I have no idea what that means. Except that he's with the Lord. Right? But that's faith. How did he get that way? Did God just look at him and go, ah, you can be an Enoch, boom, there you are. No, he exhibited the obedience of following the instructions. And as a result of that, justification was brought because he had faith that he acted out. And see that cyclical cycle? And this is where it goes back, Albert, when you and I were talking about we don't have the ability to have that faith to even know what to do. So where did that come from? Well, that came from God too. Was, was that first? Or was it the obedience that brought it? All I know is I'm supposed to be obedient and because he gives me the faith to be obedient, my faith brings out a re reaction in him that brings me to a justification in him so I can be around him. <sighs> Folks, obey God. Trust in him with all your heart and you'll be in right relationship. That's faith in action. And it can be seen by those around you. Look, these, these are the witnesses of the Old Testament. Let's look at next one. In verse 7, we see Noah. What did he do? He did something. It says in chapter 6 of Genesis that he found favor or grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Because to the best of his ability, Noah was doing something right. He was trying to obey the Father. And as a result of that, he built an ark in faith, knowing that God was going to keep his promise to cover him in an ark of protection when God poured out his wrath. There's that action again. Faith has to have action. Verse 8, we see Abraham. Abraham, what did he do? He left everything he knew, everyone he knew, his folks, his family, his kindred. And he goes to a place that, that God has called him to and, and, and God said to him, said, look all around. This is all yours. 
This, this, this is your inheritance. This, this, you are going to have so many little ones running around. They won't be able to count them. That's a lot of diapers, folks. But did Abraham see that? No. His first son, Ishmael, was not by Sarah, and so was not the seed of promise. Isaac, his son, how many other children did Sarah have? She only had one. That's a lot of stars, Lord, just in one person. But I don't see it. But did he doubt? Nowhere in Scripture do you see where he doubted. In fact, one of the most, most powerful statements that's ever said is when Abraham talking to Isaac and they're going up on the mountain and, and, and Abraham's going to offer his own son and he says to Isaac that God will provide. Speaking prophetically of the Son Yeshua, the sacrifice to be for all mankind. He knew that even if he took his own son's life, that Isaac would be raised again because that's the blessed hope and he believed that. So much so that he acted on it. He did something about it. Faith without works, folks, is a dead faith. You don't have one. This is what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. And your actions, your actions... Those works are following the obedience of the law. Following his instructions. Following his guidance. Because that's, that's what all of these have done. Look at verse 9. You have Isaac and Yaakov. What does it say about them? It says that their lives, that their actions, provided that the line stay pure. What did, what did Yaakov do? He wrestled with the Lord, right? To what point? He wouldn't let go until he received what? A blessing. I don't know if you've wrestled with God all night about something before. But he wrestled in the flesh all night with God. God could have went at any moment. But he brought Yaakov to the point where he was exhausted and gave everything he could. And until you and I give everything we can till we exhaust ourselves in Messiah, our faith can't be rewarded. You see, the journey with Messiah, what does he tell us? Forsake all, follow him. Strong language is used. It says you need to hate your mother or father. And that's a whole different teaching. But in the vernacular for us to understand right now, there's nothing in this life more important than us following Messiah and wrestling with Him. You want a good relationship with your spouse? Husband, you want a great relationship with your wives? Do you? Wives, do you want a great relationship with your husband? Get close to God. The closer you get to Him, you're going to start looking at your mate in a different way. All of a sudden, all those wrinkles that I have, she's blind to them. Miracles happen. <laughs> she still sees me as that young stud muffin I was when we married. The closer we get to the Lord, the closer we are to each other. And the same is true in our relationship in a fellowship. The closer you and I get to the Lord, the closer you and I are going to be. What do I constantly call you folks? My family. Now, I went on vacation to see my biological family. And I probably shouldn't say this because it's being videoed, but I couldn't wait to be back here with you. What's that saying? Does this mean I don't love them anymore? No, it means that in relationship with the Father, you guys have more of a kindred spirit than my, my biological family who doesn't want to pursue the Lord like I do. My heart grieves at that. I desire for them to be there, but I'm Gary. They won't listen to me. I pray that someone will be brought there so they will listen. But... Little Gary, I, I remember the little squirt. Hey, you know, I'm not going to listen to him. Now he's old and has a beard. What's that all about? They won't listen to me. But here, you may not listen to me either, but we have a kindred spirit and desire 
to want to be close to the Lord. And so it brings a close proximity to us. Yaakov wrestled with the Lord. He gave everything he had. We need to do the same. In verse 11, Sarah, at 99 ladies, she laughed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some of you are laughing nervously. Oh, I could never think of that. Tino, no way. <laughs> yeah. We're grandparents, and, and, and yeah, we're done. We're done. And, and, and yet, that was the blessed hope that they, they wanted children. And at 99, it was the time. Wow. Wow. Remarkable woman, in spite of all of her flaws. And you'll find the flaws. See, God didn't put perfect people in here. He put people in here. People with real life experience. So when you and I read it, we don't look at them and think, oh, how wonderful they are. He put them there to say, there's no difference between them and you. They struggled, you will struggle. But you can become victorious. Her faith became a reality. And she conceived at 99, bore a son. Wow. Verse 13, there are many that died by faith. They refused to bend a knee. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They wouldn't bow, they wouldn't bend, and they did not burn. <laughs> That's what kind of God we serve. Verse 22, we see about Joseph. What can I say about him? Everything was good for him all the time. That's why faith was easy for him, right? Let's spend our lives being discarded by our family because our dreams are, you know, wacko. Every, all his brothers and sisters thought he was smoking that wacky weed for those dreams he was coming up with. You think I'm going to bow to you? Ha! Let's put him in a pit. Let's do away with him. We sold him into slavery. We told our father he's dead. And we kept that lie alive. That's an oxymoron. For many years. And he was in prison. He was slave. And yet he remained faithful. He acted in obedience to the Lord. In spite of the fact everything was going wrong for him. Until one day the Lord said, now. Boom. And everything's changed. He's number two in the world, folks. When we talk about Egypt, you have to understand that Egypt at that time was the center of the world. It was the biggest economy out there. And he was in charge. Because Pharaoh just wanted to relax and take it easy. So all the hardships, seven years of bad luck, boy, if you don't make it happen right, it's your problem. Because I'm not going to look bad. You'll be the one dying. So Joseph had to make sure he had it right. But whose side was, you, uh, was Joseph on? The Lord's side, right? His faith in Yahweh, he was obedient to him no matter what, and God brought it all out. Now, I, I want to say this. Just because we're obedient to the Lord doesn't mean that tomorrow everything's going to turn out okay for you. All right? In fact, I'm going to tell you just the opposite because Yeshua said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. If they treated me evil, they're going to treat you evil. And let me go one step further. If they crucified our Messiah, there's coming a day they may crucify you or me. So we need to be aware of that. Joseph, what a wonderful character. And, and you can see all of these men. Moshe, did he have faith? Was it a faith of action? Or did he just whatever? No, he was obedient to the Lord. So his faith showed justification was brought as a result of that. Verse 30, we see, here, here we go from, from actions of a person, see, all these examples now have been worship, uh, have, excuse me, have been uh, a showmanship that, that is toward people, right? Now what about inanimate objects? Our faith, Messiah said, can move mountains. And, and we go, yeah, and we, we think about that mustard seed, but let me ask you a question. How many of you moved a mountain lately? And I'm pointing the finger at myself. I have not. I've shoveled a lot of dirt. It felt like I moved a mountain. But I have not moved a mountain by praying and asking God to move it. But if we had that type of faith, we could do that because they marched around the city with no weapons except tooting their horn after seven days and the walls fell. Why? Their faith. 
But what did they have to do to exercise that faith to bring it into the point where God to take that faith and bring it through to full fruition where justification and the walls came down? So it it works on both spectrums in our life. Verse 30, Jericho, the walls came down. We see rehab, uh, not rehab. She needed to be in rehab. No, it's Rahab. The Bible tells us that she was a prostitute. She went to to rehab because she decided that she wanted to follow the God of Israel. And so the rest of the wall, as it came down, her wall stayed standing. Why? She protected the spies that came in. She allowed them to not be found by the guards of Egypt. She put together a fastened a rope for them to escape, and she put a cord outside the window. She showcased her faith. She did something that showcased her faith so that when Yahweh came to bring judgment to her, he saw her faith, and it pleased him because without faith it's impossible to please him, and pleasing him, she found justification. She became part of the line of our Messiah. Ow! And if he can do that, what can he do for us? Through Messiah, we get grafted in. Man, I get excited about that. I'll I'll be careful. Let's continue. We're almost there. We see also that there are others. There's Gideon, Barak, there's Jephthah, there's David. David (laughs) picks up five stones, goes running at Goliath. Ah! You look like you were sleeping. (laughs) He got excited about what he was doing. He had faith that he could take out a... (laughs) My wife's going, no, no, no. (laughs) Through faith in his God, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And in faith, he picked up the rocks and he went. It never says that he wasn't afraid. In fact, if you read scripture closely, the first time David saw Goliath, he ran. So it it isn't the absence of fear. It's acting, his faith, his actions, an active faith. What about Samuel and the rest of the prophets? We could go on and on. And and chapter 11 does. It talks about extraordinary tasks that were performed. Elijah prays, fire comes down. Children are raised from the dead. Miraculous things take place in the name of the Father because of someone's faith taking actions and putting it to the task. What about verses 36 through 38 where it talks about the ability to endure hard times? Do you think it was easy for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? For Daniel and the thousands of others that were chained and brought into a line and brought all the way to Babylon into captivity? who were whipped and beaten down in Egypt in slavery. Do you think it was easy for them? No, but they were able to endure because of their faith and trust. And especially those that we just mentioned from Daniel. What did Yahweh do? In a foreign land, as prisoners, he brought them and exalted them to high positions. Insomuch so that centuries later, the Magi who were trained through a system that Daniel had put together understood the stars and the story of Messiah's birth and came to Bethlehem to see the Messiah that was being born. They endured the hardships because of their faith and belief in Messiah. Verse 39 is so depressing because all of these guys, all of these gals, every single one of them looked toward the prize, but not one of them got it. They didn't receive it. Not one of them. Should that surprise you? Well, God's way is the best way. It's the only way. So it's the best way. But His way is the best way. And He says that faith is something that you have to act out. It's something that you have to do. And that faith is following the instructions of his word. Remember that word righteousness? And it was counted unto him righteousness. Righteousness, we learned a few weeks back, means to follow, in script, to follow the scriptures. Because he says, 
My word is righteousness. And so when we tie that all together and we look at this last thought, we too wait for the blessed hope. We too, like them, do not have it. We are supposed to continue to act in faith as if we have it. Paul says, I run toward the race to accomplish it. If we're running the race, does that mean we finished it yet? No. So we're still waiting for the blessed hope. I still have to deal with the sin nature within me. I still have to deal with that beast, that enemy that keeps creeping up and wanting me to deny God, to fall away from Him, to reject God, and to do my own thing. And any time, any time I sin, any time, if you remember, sin is violating the Torah. Any time I violate His instruction, I'm committing a crime against Him. Thanks be to Yeshua HaMashiach. I can go to him and ask forgiveness. And he can put me back on the right track. But faith without works is dead. Faith has to be an act of faith to bring us to justification and sanctification. Faith must be tied into intricately with the instructions of Yahweh. Without the instructions, we don't know how to act in faith. So do we need the Torah? Do we need His instructions? Yes. Do His instructions bring us to faith? No. Our actions in obeying the Torah brings us to a faith relationship in Him. Where did it start? It was Him And it's always Him who brings you and I to the point where we begin to understand it's really about Him. He gives me the strength, the ability to have the faith to follow the instructions so that I can have faith in Him. Amen? That means you agreed with me. So that means you need to do something with your faith. All right. Well, next week we're going to pick up on the next part, which is part 10. Uh, Romans 4, verses 15, that the law brings wrath, which will be an interesting topic to be looked at.